and thank you for tuning in today. I'm Carrie Enright Cato, Director of the Office of Climate Change Technology and Research at Connecticut DEEP. Welcome to the Exploring Climate Solutions webinar series. This is brought to you by the Governor's Council on Climate Change. This past Thursday, Governor Malloy is issued an executive order creating the Governor's Council on Climate Change, also known as the GC3. They are charged with examining the efficacy of existing policies and re regulations designed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and identify new strategies to meet the state's greenhouse gas reduction targets. The Council is composed of 15 members from state agencies, quasi-state agencies, businesses, and nonprofits. To learn more about the GC3, please go to www.ct.gov slash DEP slash GC3. The Council's exploratory process this webinar series explores innovative and successful climate change solutions in Connecticut and across the country. The city provides first-hand accounts of high-profile municipal climate programs, climate issues in the corporate world, greenhouse gas reporting frameworks, statewide sustainability programs, and low-carbon fuel initiatives. Today, we have as our presenter Elizabeth Sawan, co-director of Climate Interactive, and project specialist Stephanie McCauley. While Elizabeth will be leading the presentation on multi-solving, Stephanie, who has assisted in the research, will contribute to, the res to responding to questions. Solving is a search for systemic solutions that protect the climate while improving health, equity, and well-being. We will find the idea of addressing climate change in ways that capture co-benefits intuitively appealing. There are often pra practical obstacles to doing so. Today, the potential for capturing co-benefits in various aspects of climate and energy policy and opportunities to reduce the barriers that often stand in the way. Their presentation will be about 40 minutes long, and then we'll begin, we'll open it up for questions from the audience. If you have a question, please submit your question in the question box, and we will read it aloud for our guests to respond to. For those of you listening via your computer speakers and are experiencing poor sound quality, I encourage you to call in using your telephone. Elizabeth, thank you again for your willingness to share your research and findings with us, and then I'll go ahead and turn it over to you to begin. Great, very much for your introduction, Carrie. I'm um, really happy to be here and excited to talk about multi-solving. I've been working on climate change and sustainability for almost 20 years, and I would easily say that multi-solving and the of multi is the most exciting, hopeful thing um, kind of research that I've I've encountered. So uh, I'm I'm going to share it, and uh, then in the question and answer session to maybe look about what's going on in Connecticut. So about Climate Interactive to start off. Um, the slide is not advancing even though it's in the, in the any advice for me? Uh, I had this technical before. Uh, reload presentation using the, the sharing screen mechanism. Got it. Can you tell me, do you see it? Yep, um, it's working. Great. Okay. So uh, a few words about Climate Interactive and about myself. So Climate Interactive is a think-do tank. We're 10 people. Uh, we focus on helping people see what works to address our biggest climate challenges. And we focus particularly on clean energy, food and issues related to climate change and climate resilience. The methodologies that we use all center around analysis of systems. Often we use computer simulation to help people find points of leverage to meet climate goals or other goals. We also use systems mapping, and our work tends to be very interactive with groups of stakeholders and people learn from each other. Um, related to climate and simulation that we've been involved in now since 2008. Um, there's just um, a recognition of the many uh, supporters and partners who've helped with this multi-solving work. The project uh, goes back to at least 2008. It's called the Climate Scoreboard, and it's not um, a multi-solving project per se. It is a um, impetus behind why Climate Interactive now is devoting some of its focus to multi-solving. So I wanted to start here with just a few words. It's also, if you've heard uh, us and Climate Interactive, it's 
most likely view, uh, via the climate scoreboard, which is really what we're um, most looking for. The climate scoreboard tracks the pledges that countries make in the UN climate negotiations. So last month, December 2015, probably as you know, was a big moment for global climate policy. Uh, and climate was very involved in that, uh, in the run-up to it and during the negotiations themselves, adding up the pledges on the table and reflecting back to the world uh, what those pledges meant for the long-term global climate. And we were really pleased as such a small group to have big news outlets like the New York Times um, sharing our results with people. It actually uh, has a lot of bearing on the idea of multi-solving. From one of our simulations, and if you go to the Climate Interactive website, you can find more of the science behind this, uh, on, this on the climate scoreboard. But this is looking at uh, global greenhouse emissions over the next century under four different scenarios. So the blue is the scenario where the world does nothing to respond to climate change. You can see a really dangerous 4.5 degrees centigrade, 8 degrees Fahrenheit temperature increase. The red line, this is the outcome of the Paris negotiations. INDCs is the, um, the language of those negotiations to talk to the about pledges. So countries do what they promised in Paris. Uh, there's a big improvement over doing nothing, so like 3.5 degrees temperature increase. But uh, likely know that climate scientists tell us this is a really unsafe range to be in and that a uh, really safe path for humanity is near somewhere below 2 degrees. So we have two pathways for emissions that could deliver that kind of stable, safer climate, although certainly not a climate without challenges. Um, the Paris Agreement, one important thing beyond this improvement over businesses is that the agreement also builds in this process for periodic reconvening of all the governments, um, uh, the idea of more and more ambitious action. They're, out, they're now set for a um, kind of five-year timetable of pledges and reviews of previous pledges and increasing ambition. To give a sense of global context, because I, I understand that part of the work of the Connecticut Governor's Council on Climate Change is related to that kind of long-term view and what's the pathway forward toward the 2050 target that Connecticut's put forth, a really ambitious target of 80% reductions below 2001 um, is, is my understanding. So to put that in this global context, um, this path that the rest of the world needs to be on in order to keep temperatures below 2 degrees temperature increase below 2 degrees centigrade is, is really similar to the path that Connecticut has laid out for itself. So there's this interesting process that now needs to happen uh, to talk about where do we go from here. And that has uh, big governments, both national and subnational governments and cities all over the world talking about what are their next climate targets. And any process like that there's a tension between what seems possible, which is likely um, at the high end of a range, and what seems necessary, which is at a lower end of the range. That's where multi-solving comes in, because we see a lot of evidence that this approach towards thinking about benefits is really a very promising strategy for bringing what's possible much closer to what's necessary. In other words, to expanding people's sense in terms of political realities and our fiscal realities, expanding people's sense of what's possible so that what's possible comes much closer to what's necessary. Schematic that um, hopefully makes what I just said clear in a, in a more um, descriptive sort of way. So think about the benefits that come out of policies to address climate change on two different axes. One is when will we see the benefit? Is it going to be fairly immediate? That would be down here toward the left. Or is it way out toward the end of the century or beyond? And that would be out toward the right. And then where do we expect the benefit? Is it going to be in our own communities? Or is that going to be benefit um, you know, for the, for the whole planet? When we talk about climate change, it's global climate change. So there's, you think about these kind of two spheres. There's this, this corner here. These are the needs people feel most urgently in their communities. This is the local and immediate. And then 
the irreversible future threats that tend to be global and they tend to be out. As you know, uh, when it comes to climate change, we have to address, act to address those now because of the long delays between changing the energy system and seeing changes in the global climate. Um, it could be a really challenging situation if these two sets of needs were really viewed as being in conflict. And often in the past, I'd say they have been. We tend to have different specialists different disciplines who focus on the global climate and the energy systems and people who focus on things like healthcare, well-being, um, or urban planning. What the emerging field of multiple benefits is this thing that um, I think is picking up traction around the world is that uh, these things don't necessarily need to be in such conflict. And if we uh, design for multiple benefits, there's a potential to find a whole bunch of investments and policies and options that are are bringing benefit on both of these uh, w with the same investment. So here are examples of those long-term global benefits, preventing things like sea level rise, extreme weather events, high CO2 levels, temperature increases. Here's some potential more local, more imbe immediate benefits from a new clean economy, um, fuel savings from getting off of fossil fuels, air quality, health benefits, um, lots of benefits for obesity and chronic disease that come along with good urban planning, for example. And the interesting thing about these more local and immediate benefits is that um, they aren't one-time benefits. Once we build for them, we actually continue to reap the benefits of a lot of those investments. So they are actually local long-term benefits. I think it's really important to think about for anyone um, faced setting near-term or intermediate climate targets because uh, the sooner you set ambitious targets, the longer into the future you set yourself up to reap these repetitive year-after-year -year annual benefits like fuel savings or reduced health care costs. And you see in some of the data from studies I'm going to present in a minute um, some modification of that potential. So multi-solving, as Carrie said at the beginning, uh, we define at Climate Active as the search for systemic solutions that protect the climate while improving health, equity, and well-being. Um, we think there are four particularly important reasons that this is, um, is really important. One is an ethical reason. Uh, people in our country and in our world are suffering today from things like poverty, violence, and poor health, and inequity. Um, and while we're very concerned about long-term global climate change, there's an ethical responsibility to address that present-day suffering. Uh, Multi-solving says we don't have to put those two needs, uh, pit them against each other. We can actually, if we design things well, address uh, them at once. Then a pragmatic reason, um, if any time you can solve one prob two problems with the same investment, uh, that's just good, prudent fiscal management. There's also a political or social reason. Um, Any time that you can, with one investment or one policy, meet the needs of more than one constituency, you've just increased the power, uh, political social power uh, at your fingertips to address the vested interests that we know are, are holding our current fossil fuel intensive economy in place. So it just makes sense to look for those allegiances. And then from my field of systems analysis, it's a just a principle that healthier systems be oriented toward multiple goals. And if you design with a really narrow focus on only a single goal, such as reducing carbon emissions, um, you can sometimes get perverse system behavior or poor overall system, system level performance. So often it's just good systems design to uh, look for the sweet spot where you um, are solving for many important variables at once pretty clear to me from what I've read about work going on in Connecticut that, that said so far it's going to sound very new in your state. Um, this is uh, about a month old, I guess, from Governor Malloy uh, talking about Connecticut signing on to something called the Under 2 MOU. And from being in Paris, I can tell you this was a, um, an exciting um, moment that got brought to the Paris negotiations where cities and states world, um, are talking about their uh, commitment to help deliver global climate goals. But the thing I want you to see here is in the second paragraph. So Connecticut has set an aggressive goal for reducing carbon emissions to combat climate change. In 
determined to do so in a manner that improves our environment and air quality while increasing our energy security, building our economy, and creating jobs. So exactly what I'm talking about um, when I say that Climate Interactive is researching the opportunities for multi-solving. It's uh, these opportunities. So um, what I hope to bring and share with you today isn't so much to convince you this is a good idea because clearly it is heading in this direction anyway. Say that um, what we're seeing in our research is that multi-solving doesn't uh, just happen because you want it to. It actually takes a different type of planning process, a different type of investment and policy making process. And so there are some ideas um, about what that what those differences might be. And that's what this slide basically says that uh, I have to seed your good work in Connecticut with some of what we're finding um, in other states and other places around the world. And certainly not to claim any kind of monopoly on this type of thinking at Climate Interactive. More, we're trying to synthesize um, a whole body of research that's that's been going for decades and is just picking up steam uh, in these last few years. So a handful of reports from all sorts of universities and institutions like the World Bank and the United Nations Environment Program after the last uh, in the last few years that focus on multiple benefits of acting on climate and clean energy that are drawn from some of those reports I just showed you to get a sense of how people are measuring and talking about the possible scale of co-benefits of, of good climate policy. This study that uh, comes from, is focused on the European Union. It comes from a couple uh, European health NGOs. and. They looked at the cost of Europe making its uh, previous climate pledge, so not the one that just got made in Paris, but the prior round centered around Copenhagen, making that pledge more ambitious. It, it was a 20% reduction. This study modeled, well, what if Europe went to a deeper reduction, 30%? They said be an additional 45 billion euros in costs to get that additional carbon benefit, and that's a cumulative cost from 20, I think it was 2013 or 2012 through 2020. And then they to look at the economic value of the things to the health system in the EU. And you can see over here all the different benefits they were counting. Uh, so less hospitalizations, less days of respiratory uh, illness, and um, fewer premature deaths. And they, uh, because it's not an exact science, they had a range of parameters that gave them a low estimate of benefit and a high estimate of benefit. It's a really interesting thing is the annual benefits. So here we're looking at cumulative costs um, across that whole period, but then year after year, once that investment is in place, this would be the savings to the health system. So if you, if you kind of pick the middle estimate here, it looks like it would be about 15 billion euros. For five billion uh, in outlay, and so you see that in a matter of, you know, three years, maybe five years down here at the lower estimate in health savings, you're seeing the return on the cost that it took to get that better climate um, climate result. So our, our personal lives, if anyone presented us with an investment with that kind of payback period, it would be really attractive. And so interesting to us at Climate Interactive is with this really interesting full uh, payback. You know, we're seeing more aggressive climate action because, boy, it's looking like it has a lot of reliable other benefits. And that's something, too, at the end of the talk is what might be some of the barriers that makes this return look so obvious, um, maybe hard hard to implement in our systems as they exist today. Uh, first one was the European Union. This is a global study led by the World Bank. Um, they looked at actually a bunch of different climate policies called Climate Smart Development, which is from 2014 and you might find interesting. I'm just going to show you one which is focused on transportation. So they looked at a bowl of different global transportation policies and investments. And the same sort of logic, they asked how much would it cost and what benefits would we get back? So they estimated, again, a cumulative spending. This time it was between 2013 and 2030, um, more than $400 billion of cumulative global spending. But in that period, there's a big savings, which is in reduced fuel costs because there's much more efficient transportation in the in areas with these investments. So, in fact, the, there's just this gap is the orange portion here between uh, 
governments would have to invest and um, what wouldn't get paid back just in fuel savings. And then there's this idea of annual savings year after year once you make that investment. Here uh fuel savings and economic value of um, health and lives saved. And so again, you can compare the size of this light blue with this orange area that's the gap, and you can see that once you've made that investment very quickly, year after year, you're reaping um, benefits that are the same order of what that initial investment cost you. So that question, why aren't we already doing this, um, really came to mind for me and the research team who was comparing all these studies. And so I'm just showing you two, but I picked them as being kind of representative of what we saw in our literature review that um, – and across these different sectors, it seems there's just a really significant uh, economic value uh, from the multiple benefits of climate action that leaves us scratching our heads a little bit about why we aren't seeing the world acting, um, you know, even more aggressively to address climate change. So uh, the graphs tell an important story, but there's also a human story that I think is important to keep in mind when thinking about multi-solving. Um, I'm going to go past this example just to save time, but I think the slides will be available, and this is one at the city scale. Um, so here's an example from an experiment, a pilot project in Great Britain, and the fascinating thing here is that the expenditures came from a public health budget, and it was focused on um, individuals living in substandard housing who were um, coping with respiratory illness. Instead of treating this as a medical problem, the public health system invested in home weatherization, so insulation and better windows and boilers uh, for a number of, of families, and then measured the results, and they saw things like higher temperatures in the homes, not surprising, lower spending on energy bills, again, not surprising, but really significant because they were often um, elderly people living on fixed incomes, and the public health savings they quantified in terms of significantly fewer emergency room visits and visits to, to doctor's offices. Um, so that to me is a classic example of, of moving even to the point of reaching over into the public health budget and saying we could get a win and a health win um, if we do this investment in a smart way. And I also like this example because it's now brought down to a practical scale where you can see it benefiting you know, people in real communities. Country, I think California is leading the way to show again the impact on real people in real communities, um, and this has uh, been assisted by the California has designed um, its cap and trade policy so that some of the revenue from that program is um, uh, is according to the legislation it's mandated to be reinvested, particularly marginalized communities or communities that have been disenfranchised. Um, so here's an example, which is a fleet modernization program. So it takes diluting vehicles off the road and helps families afford cleaner vehicles. And built into this program, things like health screening and flu, flu vaccinations and home weatherization, um, all as part of the same program. Uh, and uh, lots of other research has really emphasized the importance of access to reliable transportation for families to move out of poverty in terms of access to jobs and schools and health care. So we start to see um, in a very systems thinking uh, type of way these, these sort of branching tentacle processes that give a benefit but then reach out to touch people's lives in lots of other ways. Um, this is a report, if you haven't seen it, I, I thought it was really fascinating and well done by the Green Mining Institute in, I think they're based in San Francisco and it's different case studies of what was done in some of the first um, pilots uh, under that, that legislation in California. So you'll find there a whole bunch of other ideas. It ranges from things like uh, solo low-income families, vehicles for farm workers, tree planting, um, home weatherization, converting waste out of landfills into bio um, digesters for electricity. So it's a really interesting report. Um, so that's based of the set of possibility. It's the idea of investing in climate 
and in people and in, in communities at the same time. But here's the other bit of it, the but. Not all climate policies or investments are created equal when it comes to the co-benefits. So I'll do a couple examples of that. Uh, talk about what communities to address this fact that, that you don't just get these co-benefits by wanting them, that you have to design for them. So here's an example um, that we came across in the medical journal, The Lancet, compared two different scenarios for reducing greenhouse gas emissions from the transport sector in the city of London. Uh, one scenario was um, more efficient engines and more electric vehicles. The other scenario was um, replacing car travel with walking and cycling. And here's the thing, for people like me who focused on climate and sustainability for my career, I would have said that those were you know, pretty equivalently effective ideas because their reduction in CO2 is definitely in the same range. But to someone from a public health background, they would say these two scenarios have really different implications. And that's because this one has some health benefit in reducing air pollution. In fact, they thought it would prevent about 17 deaths per million people. But the transport scenario gets people out of their vehicles and moving around. And so that's paying off via reducing obesity and chronic disease to the point of like 530 fewer deaths per million people. So don't look like two kind of equal scenarios, you might as well just pick one. If you have a voice of self in the conversation, there's real advantages of one scenario over the other. And so what it points to is um, that to find the multiple benefits, to find the multi-solving scenarios, we have to include more people than just climate energy experts in the task of formulating our climate plans. And one thing I thought was, was really impressive about about the makeup of the Governor's uh, Council on Climate Change in Connecticut is that it seems to have that diversity of perspectives. So it seems to me that there's one pillar of multi-solving um, already in place that, that seems great. Uh, example, I was curious about um, the growth in jobs in the renewable energy sector in California and wondering to what extent um, marginalized groups or historically disenfranchised groups were benefiting from that. Um, so I put together the numbers that I could find. I'd be curious if other people have looked at this different ways. But here's here's what I found. So um, this is the percent of the uh, population of California falling into these three different racial or ethnic groups. The percent of the workforce, that's the dark blue line, falls into those groups. And then what percent of the solar workforce falls into those groups? boom in solar was benefiting all groups equally than the gray lines and the dark blue lines ought to at least line up. And, and seeing that at least the data I found, they're not. Um, and we know California is a work in progress and they're addressing and incorporating this. But here's a snapshot to sort of say, again, it doesn't just happen um, that your climate policy uh, can address other inequities or other needs or deficits in, in communities and in societies, um, that there, this, as an outside observer, there must be other policy elements or other investments that have to get figured out to really bring that benefit fully along with the climate benefit. Um, so two, you know, two examples of why I think it's really important to pay attention to the question of what else, what else besides paying attention to tons of carbon might you want to be thinking about and how might you want to change uh, the processes in your climate and energy planning. So the last few slides I have are a handful of working hypotheses, I'd say, from Climate Interactive about what contributes to multi-solving. Um, this is a field and definitely the last word, but offered in, in a sense of, of thought and in the question answers, it would be great to hear if Anybody thinks I've left something really important off this list? Um, here's the first thing I'd say. Invite diverse perspectives and cultivate curiosity along with expertise. Um, traditional energy and climate thinking, I'd say, you know, brought in climate scientists and energy experts and thought that that was who was needed to make that policy. Uh, the examples that we're seeing say that, that you, uh, you need uh, more 
more point of view than that, and you need the experts that you do bring in to be curious about the other methodologies and languages um, that come from other disciplines. When we were doing our literature review was to extent each different discipline has its own way of measuring, just measuring, um, you know, climate carbon is measured in different ways in different studies, whether it's a public health study or an energy study. And putting those uh, apples and oranges together was a pretty challenging part of the research that we did. Uh, um, a first rule of thumb or a corollary, say, is expect, if you're going to take a multi-solving approach, to go slow at first, to remember that there needs to be this step of learning and exploring the intersections. And that takes building trust and building relationships. And so uh, you may be racing to write your policy right away, but first you may be learning from whoever you assemble. It means between the disciplines, but also um, between the diverse constituencies in your communities. Um, uh, thinking about the potential to improve social justice and, and equity our, our climate policy, um, figure out how best to go about that. It seems obvious to say it, but it, I think it can't be repeated too many times. You need to make sure that you're inviting the people who are having that experience of what uh, social injustice you're trying to address in conversations about how climate and energy investments or policy could actually um, help with those problems. We also that having uh, frameworks that allow people to think about the multiple benefits together and visual frameworks that help them see those benefits together can help cultivate that type of curiosity. And that's why one tool we've developed, um, we flower the framework for whole systems equity-based reflection uh, is something that we're offering. And you'll find words and instructions for this on our website. But it's visual graph graphing or drawing technique where we've taken six different co-benefits. They're each represented by one of these petals or groups of co-benefits and the climate benefit uh, um, in this year. And uh, the investment or policy you might be considering, you can make a flower diagram. If you think that the investment is going to benefit food or clean water, you color that petal in green. And if you think it's going to have a resilience benefit and so on. Um, and then you can compare flower diagrams uh, between different policy alternatives. Also, um, just touching back to one slide ago and talking about equity and the distribution of benefit, the flower diagram gives you a way to bring that into the conversation so that if benefits are accruing to people who are already very well off in your communities, we encourage you to shade the petal darker at the center. Um, so an example of that might be a subsidy for rooftop solar that only can be accessed by homeowners. So you have to be enough to afford a home before you qualify for that um, particular program. So that would that, that would be shaded, you know, darker in the center. Another program, say a job training program for people who haven't graduated from high school, um, that would be a benefit directed at a marginalized group. And so there we have you um, the, the outage of the petal darker than the center. And then other benefits are fairly evenly distributed. You just shade them evenly. So different flower diagrams for two different types of investments. So you can see how this works. Uh, here's an example from a workshop we did. One is looking at uh, walkability and bikeability in the transport sector for um, permanent electric vehicles. So go through first the walkability example. Job sets could be directed at um, not not skilled workers. So you're building, say, bike paths and maintaining bike paths and sidewalks. Um, so there's there's jobs, health, and well-being. We've talked about the obesity and chronic disease benefits of active transportation. This pedal here on connection, we're really encouraging people to think about the benefits of building things like social cohesion and social capital. So walking through a neighborhood, you see shopkeepers and your neighbors. That has an effect on the neighborhood itself. Mobility, obviously, we're making it easier for people to get around by investing in that walking and biking infrastructure. Resists, um, that take a little more thought, but what the groups who drew this diagram were thinking here is remember um, in Hurricane Sandy, we, had, we saw lots of people who were stranded because there was no electricity, so gas pumps weren't working, and cars were out of gas, and people were stuck. Um, aftermath of a, um, of a package, if there's places for people to walk and connectivity through walking and biking, 
thinking that gives you a certain transportation resilience. That's what one flat diagram would look like. Here on the side, we saw fewer benefits. Um, so there's a job benefits. But people were saying, well, likely this is going to highly skilled workers at um, manufacturing facilities for electric vehicles, which might not be in our community. They might not even be in our state. Um, there would be some air pollution benefits. There would be some mobility benefits. But mobility benefits are probably going to people who can afford an electric vehicle to start with. That might not be everyone in our community. And they'd be going to people who have driver's licenses and whose vision is good enough to drive. Um, so. What we're aiming for with FLOWER is something where, at a glance, you can sort of see some trade-offs between different sets of multiple benefits. And I'm interactive, we're not saying, you know, one is better than the other. We're saying it can really help a community or a group of stakeholders to look at the whole picture with a simple tool like this. Uh, so another example that we think another element that comes into successful multi-solving is to reframe success as a best mix of multiple factors rather than maximizing a single one. Um, and so they stay, steer clear of only focusing on tons of greenhouse gas. Don't forget tons of greenhouse gas, but also think about the other benefits. And this picture comes from a tool that we developed with partners in the city of Milwaukee who are looking at different um, stormwater infrastructure choices and work with 10 co-benefits of various investment scenarios, and for each scenario, um, there was an underlying computer simulation that showed how the mix of benefits shifted. And not our job to say what's the right mix for any community. Our job is to present a way for people to think about the mix of benefits and talk about what's their vision of the future for their place and what mix of benefits um, really most motivating for them. I think it's worthwhile to have at least a mental checklist, maybe a physical one, to make sure there's a policy element for each benefit you're interested in. So just for an example, for a renewable energy project, uh, if, you, if you want to get the jobs benefit, you might really need to think about, do we need a low hiring provision or do we need a jobs training provision? Uh, it won't necessarily happen in the way you want without designing for it. Uh, I think that the renewable energy project is going to build, bring you resilience worth asking, well, what else do we need to make sure that's true? And you might find you need some sort of uh, electricity storage because if your project is tied to the grid and the grid goes down, that's not going to be resilient without storage. Um, if you think there's a community building benefit, then you need to think about what's the ownership structure um, that's going to lead to local ownership and community building as opposed to outside investors and flows of capital. Um, one thing to do at Climate Interactive is of some of the best policies to capture each of these benefits. But multi sing is so site-specific and so dependent on local conditions that it probably not be some element of finding, figuring that out for yourself, but at least remembering to check, you know, if there are no benefits we want, what are we actually designing in to make sure we get them. A really important one that we're seeing um, lots of times a barrier to multi-solving has to do with how um, budgets or authority is set up. So in a classic example, you may have to send money from the energy or transportation budget to put in, say, uh, cleaner transportation or cleaner electricity. Uh, you might see a lot of savings in the health budget in terms of fewer cases of respiratory illness. For the whole system, for the state, let's say, that could be a real win. But if you have set up um, so that people's portion or re-election depends on their performance within just that, you know, narrow sphere that's their jurisdiction, it might be difficult to make flows of capital happen in the ways that are needed. So it might be to unlock the potential for multi-solving um, near level view and potentially changing some of the incentives evaluating performance within the subsystems of the overall system. So we also see um, that many opportunities for multi-solving seem to be very much at the local level. And as we view multi-solvers, what we often hear is that the silos are actually most debilitating at the highest levels of systems, where we organize ourselves into ministries and divisions and departments. But in local communities, it's often you know, the same people are managing water and energy and education, and they see the connections. 
Um, so we're seeing a trend toward developing instruments that allow both resources and decision-making power to flow down to very local levels. The biggest example I met of this in Paris with several um, leaders at really giant global um, forces like the World Bank is investing $2 billion this year uh, in $1,000 bundles for local, uh, in this case, villages around the world in developing countries. But it's that sort of idea of um, you can motivate multi multi from higher levels, but it may really ask you to give both financing and decision-making power to to lower levels in communities. And I think that's a puzzle that's going to continue to be experimented with in the in the coming years. And I think this is the last thing to have you consider is that as you start to make progress um, on implementing climate plans, I would urge you to track the co-benefits as well as the climate progress. Um, and to think in setting your targets, maybe you have co-benefit targets as well as carbon targets and to establish baselines for both and to track progress for both. I think um, that this is particularly important as we continue that downward curve that I showed you in one of the first slides. It's going to be the rest of our lifetime and our children's lifetime, this um, effort to re reduce every last drop of carbon out of the global economy. And that, um, based on the climate results, is going to be hard because we know that the climate changes so, so slowly. And in fact, how hard we work, the climate's going to be getting worse because of carbon pollution that's already locked into the atmosphere. On the other hand, with benefits, we have the potential to show really quick um, and really important progress on things people care about. But if we aren't planning ahead to track that and to report what we're seeing, I think we lose that potential motivating force. So um, I think it's another place where I see California doing a good job. I've seen lots of case studies in the last year um, about the co-benefits California is harvesting. And uh, again, I draw your attention to that report from the Green Lining Institute that, that looked at um, some of these studies from those early pilot projects. This is my wind tool through some thoughts about mold solving. Um, and Ben, I, I think you guys to help us some some questions for the last few minutes. Yes. Yes. Um, so thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, so we do have questions coming in, um, and I'll go ahead and start reading off a few. We have quite a few, so uh, bear with me. Can you cite specific examples of how your research analysis has reduced political resistance to climate protection? Resistance often around the concerns for negative economic impact. Uh, I can tell you about about one experience from our own work, and then I think I'd point you again to California. Um, so, in our, I mentioned briefly our work in, in Milwaukee, um, which was focused on stormwater management, really brought to mind as a um, as a response to climate resilience, as they're facing like lots of places increased um, rainfall and precipitation. And they have a very uh, proactive department. Um, the Milwaukee Sewage District, who's quite enthusiastic about mold solving uh, and the benefits of green infrastructure as a way to slow the flow of of sewer in in really um, sort of high dense, highly paved urban watersheds. Um, but they were they were running into the challenge of getting from pilot projects to scaling it up, and the reason they were running into that was um, it, we did kind of framing around the stormwater benefit. And the project that we did, and the public health advocates and the environmental health advocates and the economic development advocates on uh, that watershed to start to explore scenarios where investment in green infrastructure paid off in these multiple different ways. And so it was a combination of looking at scenarios um, uh, about projects and the benefits that had rippled out of them um, that produced a, a group of people who hadn't necessarily been working together or seeing that they had a common um, uh, sort of common objective. But the problem of looking at these scenarios together managed to reframe for people in the watershed um, this opportunity. 
So, so that would be one example where I saw real people making the connections with each other and, and getting excited about it. Um, a second report that you might look at from California also came out, I think, toward the end of last year, and it's called California's Climate Leadership Could Change the World, and it's published by the Bioneers Organization. I, might, I think it might be a report on a meeting they convened, but it's quite an um, extensive look into the community organizing um, that led to California's climate legislation. Um, the message I got from, from those stories was the extent to which the local and immediate impacts on a diverse mix of California constituencies was a very deliberate part of their strategy that built the base of support to, to um, help that legislation come into place. So I think this is a pretty clear example where multiple benefits thinking um, did help address some of that resistance that the question is referring to. Um, so another question we have is, um, what analysis tool do you recommend using to develop some of the health co-benefit metrics, um, some of the underlying um, tools that, that project out the number of lives saved or the reduced cases of asthma? Yeah, I'm not the best person to, um, to endorse specific tools. I know um, there's, there's a number of EPA tools, and I'm not, I don't have the names of those at my fingertips right now. Um, there also is some, uh, I think, I found really compelling modeling studies that come uh, from the um, Center for Global Health and the Environment at Harvard, and they did some analysis on the um, U.S. Clean Power Plan that gave some of those so looking at the um, method in, in, in those parts to the, the tools would be a way to, to find some of those. Available for free or for local usage? I don't know for sure about that. I know some of the EPA tools are. I don't know their level of, of sort of deep and resolution. Uh, so what efforts are you undertaking to bring this holistic view to lawmakers to try and drive better policy decisions? Question as well. Um, we see our niche being, because we're a very small organization, um, we have a systems view. So we're creating tools like the one that I mentioned for Milwaukee, and now we're looking, working in the city of Atlanta with partners there in a similar approach. Um, and we're trying to develop things like this list of six, eight things to keep that I ended my presentation with um, it, it, feel actionable for both grassroots leaders and lawmakers and decision makers. Um, one thing we're finding is that in to climate change where you know, have a global model that provides a lot of insight with one tool. Um, when it comes to any of these co-benefits, they are very specific and very local. And so a small organization like ours isn't going to be able to help people find the exact right solutions for their situation. Um, our thinking is that we're more useful if we can point people in directions and then say um, they probably need to convene that groups of experts together to find out what is the you know what is the the magic combination of co benefits that delivers uh, what what this or this state or this region really needs. Um, I think there's a there's a big need for people to learn from each other because there's so much experimentation uh, happening around and in the United States right now. So what I'm contemplating and hearing people, you can see my email address here. Um, whether you think it would be useful to gather groups of practitioners to share with each other what they're learning and what's working and what some of the obstacles are. To another question, can you provide reference for how other groups have designed stakeholder engagement to invite diverse perspectives? One thing that we are doing in our website, so you see it up there, climateinteractive.org, we have a section on multi-solving, 
And within that, we have a section called Multi-Solving Examples. And uh, what we're doing there is just trying to uh, spur people's imagination about what's possible. So you'll find stories from around the world of really intriguing multi-solving approaches. Uh, and about a quarter of the examples are focused on specific organizations. And, and so you see a, a sort of thumbnail paragraph sketch of ideas and organizations and then links that lead you deeper into their work. So that would be a starting place. And the ambition we have for this year is to that into more of a kind of at-a-glance reference for people. So that that's interesting to at least one person on that call. This call is a is a um, is good to take that further. But for you can provide a library of examples. So a couple questions on resources. So um, so we're wondering if a few slides are available. Um, online, or if we can post them so they could utilize some of the um, information presented for, for presentations they're doing. And then just some of the reports that you cited, do you have those on your website? Great. Well, slides, these slides aren't posted yet, but we'll do we'll that um, sometime this week. And if folks of the webinar want to post them as well, I'll make sure you guys get them and you can do that. I think there's also a recording of this webinar, I understand. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, you find um, that we we put the reference for each example that we used on the slide. So once you get the slides, that should um, should take you to those to those sources. And before we post them, we'll double check to make sure we've done that. And the reports that you referenced are those on your website? Pretty new, and they probably aren't on our website. Uh, we'll make sure there's a, one more slide in this deck that references those because they're really great resources. Great, thank you. Okay, got it. I think we're done with the questions and uh, appreciate your partaking in our, in our webinar series. And um, I think we'll have some really good dialogue that comes out of this. Great, thanks so much for having me. So we will be posting this uh, recording on our website. So for those of you who know others who missed it, um, feel free to, to pass on the link, um, and we'll get the presentation up as well to use as a resource. Um, we're still lining up additional webinars for the remaining year. We'll, we'll likely have one a month, possibly two um, on some months. Uh, stay tuned, and um, we'll be sending out in invitations to upcoming webinars. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.